Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday Lunch with the Lawyer. Uh, my name is Attorney Devin Shanley with Peterson, Burke and Cross, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about marital property. This week is something near and dear to my heart because marital property is one of those fascinating areas of law that intersects two particular parts of my practice. That is family law and that is uh, estate planning and probate, if you want to throw that in, we'll talk about that. But uh, uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be fantastic. Speaking of fantastic, though, I am going to talk to you about who brings lunch today. Uh, as always, I'm going to show off my lunch, talk a little bit about that, and invite you, if you are watching, please uh, comment about what you are putting in for your lunch, because we're having lunch together. This is a great time for this. And, and I always like to share food. So this week's lunch is brought to you by, or brought to us by Bourbon Street Food and Spirits on Broadway in Green Bay. Now, normally when I show this, I show like the full plated meal. And today I was super hungry. So you're actually gonna see the bite marks out of it. But this is, I ordered the fish sandwich. Um, there we go. The fish sandwich, which was, great it's one of uh i i've been trying in the summer i try and do more fish sandwiches and this is a particularly good fish sandwich so if you are at tomorrow is friday and those of you in northeast wisconsin know friday is fish fry night so if you're looking for a fish fry night remember bourbon street down on broadway amazing fish uh the fish sandwich is very good and then today i have a bowl of soup uh it's red. Uh, so fun story. Mm. Yeah. So fun story, two fun stories. One, uh, when we were putting forward our order over at Sue, and I'm going to say a shout out to Sue. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for everything uh, we're putting in our order. I just said, you know, when the person that had recommended and said, you really should have Bourbon Street on for your lunch with a lawyer, I said, okay. And they're like, and she's got great fish and great soup. And I thought, great, I'll have the fish sandwich and I'll just order a soup of the day. Just whatever soup of the day is. And I was going to pick it up and I was going to ask. And then I had a hearing and it went a little long and I couldn't go. So, and I forgot to pass along the find out what the soup of the day is. So I have no idea what the soup is. All I know, it's really good. So, uh, uh, so that's that. Remember Bourbon Street, fantastic food. It's open. So check it out if you're looking for a date night, fish night, or uh, anything, especially this weekend. Uh, keep in mind that and really support our sponsors uh, as we're growing this economy back after some really difficult times. So thank you, and thank you again to Bourbon Street. Uh, the other fun story, Soup, my, my paralegal always te teases me about Soup. Um, uh, I went through a Soup phase for a while, especially last spring, and I mentioned that to a client, and the client actually thanked me at the end of the case by buying me a gift certificate to a different local restaurant that offered like unlimited soup with the note of here have some soup so when i ordered the soup she gave me a hard time i will say uh the other staff were, were also uh provided some lunch as well uh my paralegal ordered the burger and she gave her seal of approval and she's notoriously picky on burgers so uh, burgers are going to be fantastic uh Attorney Schlemmer has put in the delicious food. She she got some as well. And uh, uh, her paralegal in Green Bay said the chili is amazing too. So uh, really remember that. Uh, thank you again to Bourbon Street. So format for the rest of this lunch. Uh, we will talk a bit about marital property. I'll try and talk. I'm going to try and keep it to about 10, 15 minutes. Last week I talked the whole time because I got excited. And that happens, especially... Those of you who are clients, friends, enemies know that I can tell a long winded tale. So I'll do that again and talk about marital property and what that means. I'll open it up for questions. As always, I want to give the disclaimer. If I'm going to address a question, if I'm going to answer a question, it is going to be based on hypotheticals. If you have a very particular issue and you say, Devin, I just had, and then you start giving the facts about how your dad died and his ex-wife is taking everything and what are you uh, accountable for or 
you just got married and you moved here from Iowa and you're not sure what's going to be going on or something where you're going to start to put that in in your specific fact scenario, I'm going to ask that you either contact myself or one of the attorneys here at Peterson, Burke and Cross to schedule an initial consultation. That's going to be the best time for us to talk about your facts, to be able to talk through your case and try and give you some of the initial guidance and walk through about what the sort of situation you are going to face is. Today is going to be a little bit more general and nothing is interpreted to form an attorney-client relationship. So please keep that in mind. Otherwise, let's talk about marital property. To really understand Wisconsin and marital property, you've got to understand, in this sense, Wisconsin is, in the technical term I like to use, is weird. Um, specifically, when we talk about how Wisconsin is weird, we are a marital property state, uh, commonly also referred to as community property. The two terms are technically different, uh, but basically they're the same. Uh, to understand why that difference and why Wisconsin is like this, uh, we have to go back to a different age that I recall the 80s. And in the 80s, uh, there was this movement of people who were looking at community property states in this nation uh, that was primarily out west, California, Washington, Texas, uh, these sorts of western edge Pacific coast states. And they had adopted this peculiar form of property between marital couples called community property where as property was come in, it just was naturally classified as half the husband and half the wife's, including income and, and things like that. You know, basically after you're married, things become part of the family rather than just naturally one spouse's or the other's. And there is a whole bunch of people, uh, I call them nerds, who sit around and they form something called uniform laws. Uniform laws are basically the academics of the world who get together and they say, this is the way the law should be, so they can hand full laws to state legislatures who are working really, really hard anyways, and they don't have time to craft every single individual law. And they want some uniformity between all of the state laws. And they say, this is how they go. And sometimes the legislature looks at that and say, that is awesome, we're gonna adopt it and ratify it. And that becomes the law of the great state of Wisconsin or Illinois or California, whatever. And sometimes they go, no, we like what we're doing, pass. So a group of academics got together and they formed the Uniform Marital Property Act. And that came to Wisconsin and Wisconsin said, this is awesome. We're going to be the first to ratify it. And then they were the last to ratify it. Uh, the community property states didn't really sign on. They had their community property laws. They liked what they had. The separately titled property states that was more uh, East Coast and Midwest said no hard pass and Wisconsin was basically the only state to really adopt it. So when you look at community property states on a map, if you pull up that image, you'll see a whole bunch of states on the west coast and Wisconsin all standing on its own. And Alaska adopted, I believe, Wisconsin's Marital Property Act and slightly modified it. So we're not completely alone in that regard, but Wisconsin is still a little bit separate. So what does this mean? Well, Wisconsin is a marital property or community property state. So when you're married, if you don't have an agreement, uh, then you will have these laws that will dictate what is going to be shared or community property between a husband and wife. This is what's referred to as an opt out law. What that means is you can opt out, but if you don't have something that opts out, you get these laws. A couple weeks ago, or last week, I talked about intestancy. Uh, I guess you could consider that an opt-out law. If you draft a will, then you don't get the laws of intestancy. You get whatever you put into place. If you don't, you're going to get the laws of intestancy, and you're going to like it. Marital property opts very similarly. You can form something called a marital, a marital property agreement in Wisconsin. Uh, people might call them prenups. Technically, a prenup isn't really a thing in the state of Wisconsin as much as you'll see law offices draft them and say that this is a prenuptial agreement and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and people come in and want that. I respect that. Technically, in the state of Wisconsin, that's not a thing. We have marital property agreements. Marital property agreements will handle the same basic concept but they technically don't go into force and effect until you're married because it's marital property 
and that's just kind of the quirk of the law. But at its core, you're still going to be looking for the same basic concepts. You're going to be looking for a uh, financial disclosure. If this makes sense. You want to make sure that the parties know what they're saying is going to be marital property and not marital property and not hiding something. If the husband's hiding a boat in Florida that he doesn't want the wife to know about and he hides this million dollar boat in Florida and he discloses everything else and then he tries to claim that that's separate property, A, he probably would have had a good argument that it would have been separate property to begin with if it was, he had it before he was married. But B, it's not really fair because the wife wasn't really even put on notice that he had the secret yacht. So there's an unfairness and that, that kind of goes along with it that would undermine the actual marital property agreement that the two had. The other is the court is going to be looking for is that it's reasonable, that it's fair. If there's some sort of unconscionable term, then the effort, the agreement's probably not going to stand up. But if we have generally fair terms and full financial disclosure, especially if everybody is represented by an attorney, the courts are going to recognize that and they're going to allow you to opt out of that law. And you're going to be able to clarify what's marital property and what's not between a husband and wife. This marital property agreement, and this is where it gets fun for guys like me that practice, or attorneys I mean, like me, probably a better term, who practice both estate planning and family law. You can have that marital property agreement be effective on a divorce or just upon death. So you will have a lot of flexibility to be able to engineer the right sort of solution between the husband and wife. Generally speaking, the courts don't want to just come in and start forcing people to have uh, certain things uh, be the way the marital property law is. The, the law doesn't want that so long as everybody is walking into it with a general understanding of what is and the terms are fair. So what is marital property specifically? I talked a bit about the agreements, but I haven't talked about what marital property is. Marital property states that a husband and wife will share a one-half interest in any property acquired after what's referred to the date of determination. The date of determination is the latest, the latest of one of three dates. One, the date you were married. Two, the date you decided to live in the great state of Wisconsin and reside there permanently. Or three, January 1st, 1986. Why January 1st, 1986? Because that's when the law went into effect and it wasn't grandfathered in. So there's this sort of dividing date. So if you were married before January 1st, 1986 and lived in Wisconsin, like say my parents, then you might have two different sets of Wisconsin law clarifying your property. Now, the further we get out from January 1st, 1986, the more you're going to see property just going to probably be considered marital property because of uh, an issue that we'll talk about now called commingling. What is commingling? Well, to understand commingling, we need to understand once we know what marital property is, what the uh, not marital property is, and that is what we refer to often as separate or individual property. Separate or individual property is property that you would have owned from before you were married or property that was given to you as a gift or an inheritance. If property is given to you as a gift, then it's going to be just that individual parties. It's not going to be a marital asset. Uh, again, this makes a certain amount of sense and it definitely helps whenever I have people that come into my office for estate planning and they say, I love my son, but my daughter-in-law is evil and she's stupid and she doesn't give me, the, she doesn't take care of money right. And I love my grandkids, but their mom is just horrible. And I don't want that evil woman to get a penny of mine ever, which happens. In which case, well, I can say, good news, uh, the gifts that you give are not really marital, uh, but bad news, it can commingle and they say, what does that mean? Uh, what I used to say was this, and people who live in greater Northeast Wisconsin will appreciate this. Uh, once upon a time, I used to have a office down kind of by the Fox River. And I would say, okay, imagine I take an empty pitcher and I put that on the table and then I take two cups and I put them next to each other. And we take one cup 
and we walk over to the faucet and we fill it full of clean water. I put it down. And then we take the other cup and we walk out to the Fox River. Now, for those of you that don't live in Northeast Wisconsin, the Fox River is notoriously polluted. It was a super fun site for a while and I believe considered a toxic waste dump for a bit and has taken decades to clean. So I take that, that cup and I dump it into the Fox and I take it out and I put that down and I look at you and I say, okay, which, uh, which glass of water is from the Fox and which glass of water is from the tap? They will probably be able to tell the difference, right? They say, yeah. I say, okay. Now, imagine I were to take both cups of water and then pour them both into the pitcher. And I say, which water is from the Fox and which water is from the tap? Then they blink and they go, oh. Essentially, when you take an asset that would be otherwise individual in nature and you start to pour marital assets into it, it can start to take on the, the character of a marital asset. And this doesn't happen in little bits. It's either marital or it's not. What would be a better example of this? Imagine, if you would, the Smiths. The Smiths, uh, Mrs. Smith was once a Johnson, and the Johnsons own a cottage up in northern Wisconsin. It's the family hideaway that's been that way forever, and she receives it in an inheritance. It's separate property. Now, the Johnsons had let it fall into a bit of disrepair, and by a bit, I mean a lot. And Mr. Smith is an electrician, and Mr. Smith loves it at the cottage. He loves being up north, he loves being on the lake, he loves being in the environment, and he has this vision for what this place could be. And he spends every waking moment that he can, every weekend that he's off, he spends from, you know, April, uh, as soon as it thaws, to October, as soon as it starts to freeze, and he's there every weekend, and he's replacing every board, every nail, every wire, and he's up there with his buddies every weekend, and they are fixing absolutely everything. He practically rebuilds the whole thing, brings it completely up to code, and then Mrs. Smith leaves him because he spent every single moment of his at the cottage instead of at home being a husband and father. She gets tired of it and leaves him. And in the divorce, she says, and the cottage is mine. It's separate property. Now we can start to see where Mr. Smith might come in and say, hey, wait a second here. I bought all these materials with marital assets. I spent all this time working on it with my hands. I put all of this equity of money and and blood and sweat and tears into it. We paid the taxes, we paid the insurance, we took care of everything with it marital. It's not fair for her to then just take all of that and say that it's hers. And I think you would have a very strong argument to agree with this. You have to find a way to track the assets, which might be cost prohibitive. But a lot easier solution would be to form a marital property agreement. Example. Now, Many of you come here and have lunch with me, and I really, really thank you for that because I know how boring I can be. My wife is a saint, and I went to school in the Twin Cities, and we would drive five hours, and because I'm a big, giant nerd, we would talk about estate planning stuff for all five hours, and I can already hear the other attorneys in this firm going, oh my God, why did she put up with you talking about this for five hours in a car? And I don't understand that either, but she loves me, and she did. And she heard me talk about marital property a lot. And she heard me talk about commingling. And her grandfather did okay. And, you know, after her grandmother died, he would give us a gift every year. And he would be cash. And he would say, I want you to spend this on something frivolous. And if you don't, and I find out you're paying bills with it, um, next year, I'm going to buy you shoes. And you're going to like them. So my wife, loving her grandfather and knowing that was the gift, decided to squirrel away that money to spend on something completely, I mean, not necessarily frivolous, but not something like paying bills or something practical. And she loved art. So she saved up her money and would buy these really nice pieces of art every so often with the money that her grandfather would give for Christmas. And she really wanted this to be given away in a specific way. And she didn't want me to have any say over it. And she knew that 
gifts are a separate property. And so she would store this away. She knew about commingling. So she would keep a separate bank account and squirrel that money away in little bits. And finally, she would save and buy it. And my wife is very smart and very frugal. And she would uh, then, you know, she knew that if she bought on our joint credit card, that it would be, uh, that she would be able to use the reward points on her mortgage. And she really wanted to pay down her mortgage. And these were going to be big payments. So she would buy these pieces of art on the joint credit card. At this point, a lot of people laugh in the story because they know where I'm going. And I smile and I say, commingling happens. Now, the divorce attorneys would come in and say, ah, but you can track it, you can do this. And that is true. But if I decided to be a complete jerk in a divorce, could I make that argument and cause her to lose some attorney's fees and dealing with that issue? Yeah, yeah, I, I probably could. Uh, are there exceptions to marital property in a divorce? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, obviously, there's going to be separate property considerations. Uh, you're going to do in my opinion, you're going to deal with courts that deal with equity. Uh, so you're going to be looking with, you know, how long were they married? I mean, you're going to deal with the situation of how much are you going to be dealing with this? A great example is going to be uh, a 401k. A lot of people don't realize one, one of the hidden things of income or one of those in, in, hidden pieces of property that people don't think is marital property, but is, is your paycheck. Your paycheck is marital property. I don't care if you're married or, well, if you're married, then I don't care if you're living together or not, you're separated for five years. Your paycheck is marital property. And when you take a 401k, what you're doing is you're taking that little bit of marital property and sectioning it off and dumping it into a different asset. Is that going to be commingled? Eh, it depends how much you're dumping into that. Really, what we'll probably do is we'll take a look at the value at the time that you're married, how much you've contributed, and then try and equalize that out. But I know uh, Stacy had asked, are there exceptions? A 401k, you might not have people uh, really want to pick that up. That might be cost prohibitive to start valuing out that specific bit of marital property. And we'll just kind of waive that inside of a marital settlement agreement because it's going to be way more expensive to start to value and then draft something called a, a QDRO or a quadro, a qualified domestic relations order to get that little bit of marital property out of that and into this, uh, you might have a situation like that. Uh, does prenup provide certain property from being divided in divorce? Yes. So I talked about my wife. Uh, we actually have, we actually have a marital settlement agreement that's good upon death. And in that we actually list the specific pieces of art. Uh, that she bought because she wants to know she can give those to whoever she wants and i don't have any say over it if she dies first uh that's fine i don't care uh and, and that's that's the way we draft it uh would i have any say over that potentially uh because it's marital property so if you die and you use a will and you're going to give away something that's a marital asset you can really only give away half your half you, you don't have the other half it's your spouse's what if one spouse liked to gamble and kept all their winnings in a separate account are those merit winnings marital <laughs> yes um, yes they are uh, gambling winnings are income income is going to be marital unless you have some sort of agreement otherwise uh, the reverse is also true and this is one where uh, as much as your winnings is marital your debt is marital as well. So if your spouse goes out and has a secret credit card and maxes that out to the tune of, I don't know, let's say $10,000, you're responsible for half of that, uh, even if you didn't know. I'm, I'm sorry, the credit card company knows that that person is married. They've taken that into account. They know that marital property is a thing in the state of Wisconsin, and that includes marital debt. And you are probably going to be half responsible for that. You could have a situation where um, the divorce decree says the wife will be solely responsible for this credit card if that was the person who ran it up. And that's fantastic. Uh, can the bank, if the wife doesn't follow through with that, can the wife, uh, can the bank come back and collect on husband? Yes, yes, yes they can. The husband can sue the wife for not following through with the divorce order, but the bank can still collect against you. Are pets considered marital property? Um, yeah, <laughs> pets are property, not people. Uh, so 
pets are going to be in that weird area where in a divorce you might craft visitation orders if the parties are game and the judge is up for that but generally speaking yeah pets are marital property just like anything else again unless you have a marital settlement agreement or uh, some sort of uh, marital property agreement that's going to divide that. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, pets property. Property that's acquired is going to be marital. So, uh, yes. And I love it when I get good questions like this. Uh, the other thing, and this is going to be on the estate planning side, and I start to hint at this, well, okay, what deposit accounts or college savings in the names of the children? If it's property coming in, that is going to be considered marital. The marital property is not going to be considered by titling. Maybe I can make a good clarification on this. Um, a situation I've dealt with more than once. Uh, let's say you have uh, a spouse who dies and they own a house and the spouse, uh, it doesn't matter. Let's say the decedent, the person who died, the house is in their name. Uh, and that person has children from outside the marriage does the children from outside the marriage have a right to force a buyout of the house? Yes. The, the person on some level, even if, well, let's change it up, instead of the person who died, could they make an argument that, let's say the person who's died and their name isn't on the title, uh, that the person who died who didn't have their name on the title, could they come in, could their heirs come in and say, mom had a marital property or dad had a, uh, a marital property interest and we want you to pay. Yeah, yeah, they could. Um, a marital property interest doesn't have anything to necessarily to do with title. So a bank account and the deposit account, that's going to be a named asset. That's going to be the title. But a marital property interest is more of an equity interest. It's going to be something that a court comes in. And if that's a commingled asset, then that could be considered a marital asset that the other spouse or the heirs of the other spouse could come in and enforce. Is a prosnuptial agreement able to protect assets after marriage similar to a prenup? Do you draft these agreements? Yeah, you can clarify that. I mean, a post-up agreement, oh yeah, a post-up agreement would be a marital property agreement. Could you protect those assets? Probably. Um, it's gonna depend, uh, it depends who you're protecting it from. If you're protecting it from the bank, unless you've got the bank to sign on, uh, you're not going to protect it, but you could ensure that one person is contractually obligated to pay it uh, so you'd be able to collect against your future former spouse in that situation or the other person. Do I draft those? Yes. Yes, I do. That's a great question. I do draft those. Uh, I draft those as a part of uh, true sort of uh, nuptial sort of agreements, so anticipation of a potential divorce. I draft those as a part of an estate plan. In an estate planning context, we're looking at controlling heirs. We're looking at controlling, if we're going to try and clarify property that's sitting inside of a trust, there we might have an issue whether it's going to be marital or not, depending upon whether that trust becomes irrevocable if one person dies or not. Uh, there'll be a lot of different things. And, and the, the big thing that I would end on, because we're starting to run out of time, but if you still have questions, please ask. Uh, the, the, say that I like, the phrase I like to use with marital property is this. Marital property is not an issue until it becomes an issue. And then it's a really big issue. The reason why is simple. And it has to go back to where we started. Marital property is an opt-out law. That means as long as you guys are agreeing, you guys can form agreements. A marital couple, a married couple can form agreements. And the court will generally honor those agreements. So if the married couple is agreeing and they're on the same page, you're not going to have a problem. The problem here is when you don't have people on the same page, then you're going to have a big problem because typically what happens when married couples stop agreeing on stuff and they stop seeing eye to eye, they get really bad and it starts to get nasty very quickly. And the worst parts about it is going to be when you have a situation where it's not even the married couple anymore. And then when you have to deal with the stepchildren after a spouse is deceased, if you have to deal with, uh, in some cases, 
uh, a creditor or the state of Wisconsin who are coming in and enforcing somebody's marital property issues when you thought that you had it resolved with your spouse, that can be a big, big deal. And again, at that point, that creditor, state of Wisconsin, those heirs, they are not necessarily looking to agree with you. They are looking to get theirs. And post-nup agreements can work to try and connect some of those some of those parties in. It'll depend upon who and what we're trying to protect. But yeah, uh, marital property agreements are a better idea than most people think, whether we're talking in a prenup situation or a post-nup situation. And I got to uh, forgive myself, uh, an attorney, an attorney Schlemmer, she asked in there for the post-nup, is post-nup able to protect? For a second, I was actually thinking after the after the whole marriage. So it's like, that would be what's called a marital settlement agreement. But uh, a post-nup, uh, that would be a marital property agreement. So that would be after the after your marriage, but before your divorce or death when the marriage ends. Uh, yeah, those are, those are very important. We draft those a lot uh, inside of my estate plans. So a uh, quick plug for my estate plans. My estate plans, one of the things for married couples, I actually include as a marital property agreement. That would be standard at no additional cost. Uh, it's also not unusual for me to draft post-nups or marital property agreements for couples that are going to be looking at something very robust. They want to protect each other. They want to make sure that if there's a divorce, then there are very clear rules that I have drafted those. And, and that can be a very good tool as well. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> and and Stacy's laughing at me. Uh, so thank you uh, for joining. Thank you for the questions as always. I, I really love it when we have people participating. I really love it when I have a great fish sandwich to eat. Uh, thank you for watching. Next week, uh, we'll actually have Attorney Rousseau. So you'll get to have a change up. That'll be amazing uh, just because she is really smart. So join us next week and at Peterson Burke. And if you have questions that are drawn out of this or you start to think, I really need that sort of marital property agreement or I really need a plan, uh, give us a call. We will schedule a free consultation because at Peterson Burke and Cross, we specialize in you.